what has to go in if love is going to come out. I'm sure you have your favorite uh, Bible passages or Bible sayings about love, but my guess is the one that we're about to read has not made your top ten list yet even. I hope it will maybe after tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5 says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. This is one of the more obscure passages, I guess, about love, but it's no less important than the ones that you know better. I hope you'll add it to uh, the scriptures that you love about love. Let's give it some context. Let's back up and read from verse 3, advance through verse 7. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Question, should you love yourself? Of course you should love yourself. But when you need all of the attention, like some people we just read about did, when you crave the influence like they did, it's not love for yourself, it's obsession with yourself. It seems that Paul wanted Timothy to get the picture before he got the names. He said there are certain persons who have swerved from these in verse 6. But then before this chapter ends, verses 19 and 20, he said there are people who, rejecting faith and a good conscience, have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander. Paul said, I've handed them over to Satan so that they would learn not to blaspheme. Hymenaeus and Alexander had swerved from the gospel goal. It was all about them, really. They stirred things up. Speculations and endless discussions about genealogies and all sorts of things that that kept people having to come back to them to talk about such things if they wanted to talk about those things. But by their self-absorption, Paul said that they had made shipwreck of their faith. They feigned interest in other people in order to feed their own desires. Now, what do you think about people like them? I already know what you think. Because we all think the same way about somebody who's so caught up in their egotism. It leaves a bad taste in everybody else's mouth, and nowhere like it does in the mouth of God, our Savior. The gospel goal is to make people love God and to really love each other. Well, what's a good recipe for love? Read verse 5 one more time. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Love that comes from, love that issues from, love that's from these three things. If it's translated in your Bible from, or issues from, or comes from, it comes from the Greek word ek, just two letters. And that means uh, out of. It's, uh, you see the signs on either side here for our exits. Well, those come from that word, ek. This is what comes out. Love is what comes out when these three ingredients go in. First, Paul says, a pure heart. 
The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrates His love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, how does that affect you? That's God's demonstration. There's no greater way that His love could be expressed than that Christ would die for us. If we get any kind of handle on that, 1 John chapter 3 and 4 say that makes us love God back. We love because He first loved us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, Peter relates this demonstration, which we can see in our minds, to God himself, whom we've not seen yet. And he said that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Peter was sure that he was writing to some people who wanted more than anything to see God. They understood the demonstration of God's love for them and, and they wanted to return that love in every way that they could, but, but ultimately, I want to see God. Though you haven't seen him, you love him, Peter said. In this chapter, a few verses later, Peter said, verse 22, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. When we understand something about the way that God loves us, it causes us to love him back, and it makes us love other people too. We who've been born again love one another earnestly from a pure heart if we continue to remember what God's done for us. David wanted to have a clean heart, but he didn't always, did he? Sometimes David was more obsessed with himself than he was feeling love for God, and it got him into trouble. We believe that Psalm 51 was written in the aftermath of his lust for Bathsheba and the way he acted upon that in a number of ways. But finally, being a man after God's own heart, he was so sorry for it. In Psalm 51, verse 10, he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. James chapter 4 Verse 8 assures all of us, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. In the recipe that Paul gives Timothy, the first ingredient is a pure heart. That means we have decided we love God more than anyone else, more than anything else. And whenever something gets in the way, we're ready to clear it out with God's help. James said, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Love's going to come out when first you put in this ingredient of a pure heart. And then the next thing that Paul said in 1 Timothy 1, verse 5, is that this love issues from a pure heart and a good conscience. Do you have a good conscience? The reason we come to Christ is that we don't have a good conscience. Some young ladies in in the last week decided things are not right between God and me. Things are not right in my heart and in my life, and they need to be different. Well, what can people like us do about it? Well, we couldn't do anything except God had done something about it. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says that Christ died, the righteous for the unrighteous. That's who we know we are in our consciences. Christ died, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Three verses later, Peter is writing, Now, baptism saves you. 
not as a washing away of the filth of the flesh, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We come to God through Jesus because we need a good conscience. We're begging Him for it. And when we've been baptized, we have His assurance that things can be right, that they are right now. Well, from there on out, there's a certain way to live. And Paul uh, told an audience that that's the way he endeavored to live. In Acts chapter 24, verse 16, his words before them were this, So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. David Lipscomb and and J.W. Shepard in their commentary on the passage that we're studying tonight said a man's conscience is defiled, blinded, seared by doing what he knows is wrong or refusing to do what he knows is right. And there's no more dangerous condition in which a man can place himself than to habitually do what he knows to be wrong or refuse to do what he knows to be right. Living with a bad conscience or living with a conscience that doesn't care anymore Really, that's a bad place to be. But if we'll go on ignoring our conscience when it is speaking to us, love's not going to come out. If it's all about promote me, if it's all about protect me, like it was with these guys whom Paul uh, named in 1 Timothy chapter 1, love's not going to result. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 urges us to... uh, Keep our eyes fixed on God and to do what Jesus has given us the ability to do. Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Keep drawing near to God. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18, the writer made a request, pray for us, for we're sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. Is that your desire? To act honorably in all things. You don't have ulterior motives whenever you're relating with other people. You're not there aiming just to get what you can get for you out of the other person. You have their best interest at heart. Paul says the first two ingredients of this real love are a pure heart and a good conscience. And then one more thing, he says, a sincere faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Timothy had that kind of faith. And the way he got it was at home. From people who loved God before he did. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, describes Timothy's childhood and, and the outcome of it. Paul said, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. A sincere faith, one that is genuine. Sincere, that's translated from the Greek word anupokritos. And that's a a word with a a prefix on the beginning of it that means not. The rest of it is upokritos. And that's the word which we've just borrowed into our language, transliterated for hypocrite. Faith that's not hypocritical. That's a key ingredient in real love. When we think about hypocrites, we think about Jesus and his scathing rebuke of the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. Whitewashed tombs, inwardly full of dead men's bones. That's just one of the ways that he described them in Matthew chapter 23 and and aimed to convict them. But Jesus was so thorough and so dead on in his identification of what those men really were that now if we say somebody's a Pharisee, we mean hypocrite. 
Pharisee to them meant that they were separated ones. They were different than everybody else, religiously, spiritually, really that they were better than everybody else. That's what it meant to them. But now the word has come to mean a hypocrite. Now, wouldn't that be awful that your name in the future was synonymous with hypocrite? Because everybody knew that your faith was not genuine. Genuine faith and love are inseparable. In First and Second Timothy and Titus, which were all written close to the same time, Genuine faith and real love are inseparable. There's an example later in 1 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 14, here's what Paul says brought about the change in him. The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Love doesn't just happen. Not real love. The world doesn't know real love. There are lots of counterfeits. Real love comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. In his commentary on on this passage, Wayne Jackson called that a lovely trinity of truth. Pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. You mix them together and you get real love for God and for other people. A few years ago, about this time, I was away for a gospel meeting in Vinland, Kansas. I was happy to go there, and most everybody there was happy for me to come. Everybody except for my friend, Tate. There's a handful of you who know who I'm talking about. Tate Smith. He's the brother-in-law of Emily Smith, Emily Murray Smith. Tate was turning 16 years old that week. The reason more people than, than just a few know about Tate is because his, his mom has written about him extensively and about life with him over the years. A lot of people have read it. You see, Tate is uh, autistic, and you don't doubt it the first time that you meet Tate. He's he's very lovable, but he can get really upset about some things. And you know what he was upset about that week? All he knew was Danny Boggs was coming to Vinland, and it was supposed to be Tate's birthday. And in Tate's mind... Danny Boggs was coming to prevent Tate from having his birthday. Now, by the time I left, Tate and I were friends. Some friendliness helped. A Pizza Hut gift card went a whole lot further to show that I didn't have have anything out against Tate by coming. But here's what Tate was calling that gospel meeting. He was calling it a gospel meaning. And not meaning like you and I talk about the definition of a word, but he had invented a word. Danny is mean. And he's coming here to mean me with the gospel. I hope you and I never give anybody really a gospel meaning. Paul could point the finger at some people in Ephesus who were taking the gospel and they were taking the law, they were taking all the Bible they had. They were using it for their own benefit to the hurt of other people. But it didn't really benefit them either. They made shipwreck of their faith. Because they made it all about them. Paul said the aim of our charge, the gospel goal is... And he he doesn't say immediately to go to heaven. Does God want you to go to heaven? 
Yes. Does God want you to spend eternity with him? Yes. But he said the aim of our charge is love. Love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. The gospel has a goal for right now. And that's that you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that you love your neighbor as yourself, as the law put it, as Jesus reaffirmed. Now, when I read what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, no one can love like a real Christian can love. Because genuine love issues from, it comes from, these three ingredients mixed together. So, you think tonight about your heart. You think tonight about your conscience. You think tonight about your faith. Is there anything there that's going to keep you from loving the way God wants you to love right now? Is there anything missing from that mix that issues in love? You think about it. If you need to do something about it, do it tonight. As we said at the beginning of the service, we become Christians when we put on Christ in baptism. Do you have the faith in Christ and the the resolve in your heart Turn away from sin to confess your faith tonight and to be baptized in His name for the forgiveness of your sins. Fellow Christian, do you love the way that you ought to love? Is there a reason we need to pray for you tonight? Again, this is an invitation. We're singing to give you an opportunity to share what you ought to share with God's family here. Will you come while we stand and sing together?